Lifers TLC. I'm Laura. And I'm Jay. And today we're super excited to have Tanya and Aaron with us. Hi, guys. Hi. So can you tell everybody what are you in this crazy transplant and donation world? Uh, well, we are scheduled to have a renal transplant May 7th of 2021. And, and Aaron, um, you are going to be the... I'm going to be the recipient. And Tanya, you are? I'm his living donor. And you guys are also married. We are right? happily married, yes. Uh, <laughs> I like that you guys added in happily. That's great. <laughs> I'm very glad to hear that. So, Aaron, can you tell me what caused your, what caused your need for the renal transplant? Well, um, I've suffered from high blood pressure for a number of years. And in July of 2019, I actually had a, a medical stroke. Um, according to the MRI, I've actually had multiple strokes during my lifetime, yet I live. Mm -hmm. And that stroke um, pressed my kidneys into stage four, stage five chronic kidney disease. Mm -hmm. And as such, um, I need a new kidney. Okay. Or I need a kidney that, that works. <laughs> <laughs> A working one would be great. Yes. So are you currently on dialysis? Are you able to hold off on that? What's that look like for you? Well, we tried for uh, as long as possible because my numbers after uh, working with the, the better, uh, my third nephrologist um, were holding, but um, they declined sharply at the turn of the year. And um, about a week and a half ago, um, I went to the ICU. Uh, I experienced renal failure and I am on dialysis three times a week uh, until May 7th, until the surgery. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you look amazing for being in ICU. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you so much. Ago. I appreciate <laughs> it. <laughs> he's sh he shaved before. <laughs> don't don't get it twisted. He's not always nice and clean shaven. I always tell him he looks a little bit angrier and older when he's not shaved. <laughs> so you were able to hold off then quite a while for having, you know, ESRD and stage renal disease. So before you needed dialysis, which is awesome. I'm sorry that you weren't able to Hold off quite until your transplant, but it's super exciting that that's happening as soon as it is. Sorry so about it's okay. Uh, so you, so you weren't, so your renal disease came from high blood pressure. Yeah. So you don't have any, you know, you have end stage renal disease, so ESRD because of that, but everything else with your kidneys prior to that was okay. I wouldn't say that it was okay. Um, I actually have a first cousin uh, with the same last name and everything here in Chicago. And he also um, experienced a, a renal transplant from a deceased donor. And uh, prior to that, he was diagnosed with FSGS, which is a kind of rare condition, but you can see it in NBA athletes. Um, people who, you know, live reasonably good lifestyles. So there's a potential genetic component to my disease as well. So I don't thankfully have any other conditions other than the high blood pressure, which kind of burned up my kidneys. And it's, it's a cycle that starts. So sometimes if your kidneys aren't performing at the level they need, it also affects your blood pressure. Right. And essentially, you end up in the stage that I'm in. So... Yeah. And people can live a long time in stages one through three, you know, with corrections in their lifestyle and diet and things like that. But once you enter stage four, there's really essentially no exit from that. And you're going to either, you know, need a new kidney or go on dialysis. So. I know you mentioned um, that you had suffered multiple strokes, right? You found that out um, dating back to how, how far back? Was the, I would say 2011, 2012. Okay. Okay. Um, didn't even know it. Did yeah, you? didn't even know it. So um, about four and a half years ago, I had a uh, yeah. central retinal vein occlusion in the back of my right eye, which was probably a stroke, oh. misdiagnosed. Um, and yeah, uh, it's just one of those things where if, if I, you know, 
we want to encourage people to get good medical yes. attention and and care and sometimes if you need be you know get a second opinion absolutely because which and i like that you brought that up because did i hear you you said this was your third nephrologist now, yes correct? this is my third nephrologist who finally put me on the proper uh blood pressure medications that at least were able to sustain us for a while yeah. before we needed to do this renal transplant but the first two were um I don't, I'm not going to badmouth them and I'm not going to mention any names with any of the medical professionals, but I just think that there's a void oftentimes in um, the treatment of African Americans in the medical community in terms of the specializations. And in my particular case, uh, you know, this is something that affects a lot of African American men age 45 and up. And there are certain medications that are better than others and uh, for African-American men. And uh, I was told to, you know, stop eating pizza and drink more water, even though I was eating largely vegetarian and uh, take this medicine, then further than that, take more of this medicine. And it finally tipped the scale and I had a stroke. So I would just encourage, you know, to make sure that if you're not, making progress with your blood pressure or your diabetes or any of those things that can lead to kidney disease um, that you get a second opinion and find someone who can really help you. So. Absolutely. I think that's so important because we don't, you know, I think oftentimes I hear from people, whether they're transplant related or not, that like they just, you know, their, their doctor knows best. Right. And it's like, you have to like, yes, doctors have more degrees typically. I know they have much more than I have, but you really have to advocate and have that advocate for you. And Tanya, are you his advocate? Do you feel like? I would, I would say that there's been many times um, in this journey that I always, I think I've told Aaron on several occasions, you have to be your own advocate. And um, even when we were in the hospital, Aaron was on a specific medication prior to admission that, um, he had a stroke on and what it was called. Oh, we're not going to do that because no, I, it'll okay. just open up liabilities yeah. and things okay. like that. We don't but it was, um, any trouble, it was a but... specific medication mm -hmm. and they were getting ready to put that in his IV and we caught it at the very time. And I said, what medication? And, and they explained it. And I said, no, I said, we are not, we're not taking that medication. And he kind of looked at me and I would get kind of, agitated with Aaron because I'm like, you have to be your own advocate, but I believe that, you know, um, that's where our, just speaking up, you've got to speak up, yeah. um, for your health and, and health is life, right. Health is well. Right. And when it comes down to medications and having that person writing things down, the side effects, mm -hmm. we know our mates, we know the person that we live with. And when we start seeing side effects, like uh, that doesn't seem right. Yeah. We've got to speak up because it's our loved ones that are at risk. We, you know, right. we have to know ourselves as well, too, yeah. know, how we're responding to specific medical recommendations. We're not against science. We're not against medical science. We're not against knowledge and research. We, and, you know, we, we are all for that and, and we support that. We're not like apprehensive, but it has to be done well. It has to be for your life. Absolutely. I mean, truly, for the sake of your life, it has to be done well. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, you need to ask, not be afraid to ask for that uh, yeah. for yourself. Now, unfortunately, we hear that story quite a bit, like um, the misdiagnosis part, right? Where, where you go to one specialist, and I've heard it time and time, it's even happened in my case. And although I won't name the medication as well, there's a medication kind of found out by accident and had a reaction to it you know and and that's why i also feel like continuity as far as going to the same doctors and going to the just having this team having a you know uh, a team that's you know, because i know of people who've gone to different hospitals and you don't get the same workup or the same care because you're not with that you know when you come in er you're just another person they don't know about your your you know frailties or anything about your condition, right? They just mm -hmm. say you're presenting as whatever, you know? Mm -hmm. So 
it seems like you guys have a great team as well who you like, yeah. you know, who's really supportive and you have all that. And I think that makes a difference in your care as well as advocating for yourself and having a great advocate. And insurance plays a huge role. Well, yeah, true. Insurance yeah. plays a huge role, unfortunately, mm -hmm. yeah. in, in these in these cases. And there's individuals that don't have insurance that are facing these medical conditions that don't necessarily have the opportunity to get maybe the help that they truly deserve because they're looking at more how many inpatient stays, how many more diagnostics can we do and run out the in, you know, run out the insurance. So mm -hmm. there's like a huge overall um monster of things yeah. that happen when it comes well, to a diagnosis yeah i mean that that that's a whole different conversation we'd overrun this entire interview if we went into the whole healthcare system and how you know certain procedures and certain medical operations and things need to be handled you know financially it's it's a i guess just a, an unbelievable consideration uh, for some, and we're just thankful um, that we are fortunate enough to have and blessed enough to have good insurance during all of this. Mm -hmm. And there, there are people who are in situations where they don't, and they have to make decisions um, about their health um, based upon what they can financially do. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. Yeah, which is... So devastating. Yeah, I'm just gonna make, make one last point. Um, you talk about uh, the importance of African American men, as you already know. You know, um, in 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 our community, not you know, as men, there's not a lot of uh, us who actually take the time to go to the doctor, and for whatever reason, it's just you know, there's this this uh, kind of uh, mentality in the community where everybody's scared to find out what's going on with them. So I wanted to, to just applaud you for that, you know, Thank kind of saying, hey, something's going on and I need to get checked out and not That's being true. afraid because, you know, as men, a lot of times we, you know, have to play that tough guy. A lot of people thinking, you know, it's a, it's a important that we, as we age, we get, you know, different special care. So I, I agree totally. Absolutely. We do need to take care of ourselves. We need to encourage each other as brothers yeah. and say, hey, you know, it's all right. You know, I got you. Let's do this together. Let's make sure that, you know, you're OK. Yeah. And, and, uh, and as his help me, I would like to say that, you know, to the to the spouses and to the wives uh, supporting um, the men, um, sometimes we get we are afraid. Um, you know, as my husband, I think that whenever he first originally was told a diagnosis, he, he really didn't want to believe it. And he kind of, I wouldn't say ran from it, but it wasn't as, it wasn't as important because the word disease was not attached. Right. They just described, you know, the performance or the functionality percentage of my kidneys, the uh, GFR, the, the filtration rate. Mm -hmm. And they were just describing it in, you know, quantifiable filtration rate terms. And one call after a, a blood test, a nurse called me and referred to it as disease. And that was the first time I'd heard anyone refer to what was going on with me as disease. And then it made me, you know, well, my immediate response was denial. I don't have a disease. What are you talking about? Disease. I just need to and it's chronic kidney disease. And mm. we began our research on what that really meant. And so, yeah, it's just, a, we, we've gone through all of the emotional cycles I'm sure. <laughs> uh, yeah. of all of these things before the surgery. And uh, we're at a position and a point of acceptance and serenity about it and hope and faith and love. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that's you know, we're prayerful people. We're people of faith, um, and we're you know confident that Northwestern Medical, uh, Northwestern Medical in in Chicago, is you know giving us or about to give us some of the best of of their best. So just all of those in combination, all of the love that people have shown us, um, and you know coming over to visit us to give us meals and 
-hmm. all kinds of things have been amazing. It's amazing. So. So tell me a little bit. So you, when were, when did the team approach you and say, we feel like the best treatment option? Cause we know that ESRD is lifelong, right? After your transplant, you'll still be diagnosed with ESRD. Your treatment is just transplant. So mm -hmm. when did your team say, we think it's time for you to consider a transplant? Well, Aaron actually um, went into the ER and he was admitted um, his high blood. He started having high Whoa. blood pressure and his nose was bleeding. So we ran, we, we went right to the ER. We didn't know what was going on and he was having a stroke. So yeah. we got admitted. Um, they put him on the heart floor um, at Edwards and his nephrologist came in and said, within six months, you either need a transplant or to start dialysis. And right. that's how our journey started. So, yeah, everything from my right shoulder down um, to my, you know, the extent of my hand was like waving like a horse's tail. And um, it happened at 316 in the morning <laughs> um, in our apartment 316 coincidentally i've got the garmin data to prove it and uh you know i'm just really thankful that tanya was here and that you know we were she she was awake when when i woke up and uh i couldn't sleep that night and, at all yeah like about one in the morning she woke up from a nightmare since she was angry and i didn't know why i think is what i exactly <laughs> said to him yeah. and the next thing i know he went to the bathroom and his nose was bleeding and I was in shock and we, I said, let's go to the emergency room. Yeah. And yeah. he was having a stroke and that's where our journey really started yeah, I mean, it was, last July of 2019 yeah, I mean, in was, regards to. Yeah, it was an interesting situation in that like, I, uh, they, she asked me, when is that, when is our anniversary, which is October 27th, 2016. And I, I could only speak in single digits. It was like one zero two seven two zero one six is what I was saying. Wow. And they, uh, they asked me to draw a clock and it looked like a two year old had drawn it and to sketch it out. It was, yeah. they and asked me what year it was. And I said, 2029. They didn't <laughs> even know who the president, he didn't know who the president was. It nothing. Was, yeah, it was. It was a very scary time. And um, as his, as his wife, it, I mean, our life just, it was like, it, it was like hitting a brick wall. Like it was just right before our eyes. One minute, you know, he's saying, why are you going to take out the trash at three o'clock in the morning, one in the morning? One in the morning Cause I couldn't sleep. And the next thing we're in the ER and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, you know, what's going wow. on? Yeah. yeah. My goodness. So Edwards is not a transplant center, right? So did they refer you then to Northwestern or did you guys set out on your own journey to find them? They suggested that we do one of two um, facilities in um, Chicago and we chose Northwestern. Do you know why you chose Northwestern? I don't remember. There were two. I think U Chicago was one of them and Northwestern was the other. In terms of Illinois here, of you know who are, who are the best places to go for a transplant? And uh, yeah, but uh, I guess the, the biggest thing in all of this is that she's a match. Right. So I was going to get to that. So when you first went in, you know, they talk about um, they talk about deceased. They talk about living. Did you guys go in having already done your research? Like, did you know you wanted to go the living route? Were you guys kind of up in the air? Because you said that you had a cousin who did a cadaver kidney so what was kind of your thought process when you guys started that yeah I didn't know any of that we didn't really know exactly I mean we went in getting educated the okay. difference between deceased and living donor um and when we were in the actually education class we knew that we were the same blood type mm -hmm. but because it was so time sensitive and they were putting this time frame on it saying it's either dialysis or a transplant his his fear he did not want to do dialysis that was like something he wanted to stay away from he's had family members 
And so it just struggled for it through years. And so I think that that was something that he really didn't want to do at all. Mm -hmm. And so when we were going through the education classes, I'm like, I checked that mark. I checked that mark. I raised my hand. I said, I would love to be tested today. And then um, I think in a couple weeks, they set up the evaluation process because we were the same blood type. And that's really, I mean, we didn't, we knew that he would be put on a list. And I think the average wait for his blood type was four to five years. Yeah. Four, four years is usually on the list. So first of all, I want to stop and say, I, um, I'm a blessed man. (laughs) I married a superhero. Um, But I want to go further in that we're more than just a match at blood type. We are six out of 10 markers identical Mm -hmm. um, for this transplant. It's like two people meeting on a bus, falling in love and happening to be a match. The odds are something between uh, one in 50,000 and one in 100,000 of two people like us being married and of different ethnic backgrounds like this and being a match. Um, So it's, it's a beautiful thing. I didn't, I didn't really, I honestly didn't think that we would be a match. I, I I thought, well, we were the same blood type, but I was going to try to get tested as much, do whatever I had to eliminate myself. um, Because I I ask you from there, so when you were going through and you knew you were the matching blood type, but you didn't necessarily think you guys were going to match, were you going to participate in a swap then? Was that your goal or was it was just a if he's not yeah. a match to me, then we'll stop here and move on? It's a possibility. Yeah. But we didn't even know that that process existed okay. before all of these things happened, right? We just thought, you know, a match had to be a match. But, you know, there's ways to where, they, you know, there's this swap, swap thing that you're talking about where people are... You're not a perfect match. You can the match pool. with someone like else. Some kind of pool. Yeah, yeah, they have like a database essentially of potential donors or people who want to give and donate for their loved ones. And then there's a, a swap, a swap process. And it, even if I w- if I wasn't a match, I would have hopefully helped somebody out else out that would have helped him out. Mm-hmm. And and I had I had made my mind up that even if he was not, I was not a match with him. That I, I mean, somebody else's husband was waiting, somebody else's wife, somebody else's child was waiting. Right. Um, and if I could make a difference in someone's life and it could make a difference in Aaron's life or somebody else's life like you, I wanted to be a part of that. And mm-hmm. I think that that was when I knew that I could play a part in someone's life at that point. I just had to say yes. Yeah. That's awesome. So you guys were kind of on parallel lines then, right? With getting tested and, you know, going through the whole process. Cause you said you got the call just a couple of weeks after Aaron started, right? Mm-hmm. So you guys were kind of chugging along at the same time or things kind of happening simultaneously. Was it not so much like that? <laughs> I mean, it to me, it was a struggle because whenever I went through all the testing, we were, they took us in the small room and you know, the doctor was at the computer and he's like, I think we found a match. And, but then my uh, glucose levels were really high and they said, everything else looks good. Um, but you know, your glucose levels are high and we just want, we're going to send you for this additional test to rule it out. Maybe it was just something out of the ordinary. And then they told me my A1C was, you know, higher than what they would want, um, for donors. And so when that happened, they told me I had to lose 25 pounds. Um, So the pressure became real (laughs) at that point. Um, And I had to really evaluate, wow. I mean, they're giving us a time frame of six months. I told them to go ahead and put him on the active list because there's two different lists, active and inactive, Mm -hmm. because I didn't know if I could get it done. And even if I could, I don't know if my test results are going to become to where I I could go forward. So it was a limbo power, a limbo pattern for, I mean, for a year of getting tested, monitoring my A1C, hoping that nothing um, happened to my health in the meantime, and hoping that his numbers were stable. Yeah. Thankfully, my numbers were actually holding 
um, in stage four for through, throughout the, the pandemic. Throughout the pandemic. <laughs> so it was just, you know, wow. You yeah, know. it was it was a, it was a very <laughs> stressful time because um, as his wife, even though I wanted to help him, I didn't know what his body was going to do, especially in a pandemic. They were holding off surgeries and, um, you know, his numbers started decreasing significantly. Um, and he went six months without getting a blood draw. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so, yeah, well, yeah, six months. Sense, yeah. Cause he used, he usually saw the doctor every three months. Mm -hmm. Right. And right. then, um, during the pandemic, his doctor canceled because there was Just a family once. emergency one time. So, and so within that six. one appointment, his GFR decreased how many? Well, the GFR changed from the twenties to the teens. The teens. Like and the uh, the creatinine level specifically, which kind of is a major indicator of how toxic you are. The creatinine level went from in the three range, which was still stage four, it jumped to seven. Wow! And then just about a week and a half, two weeks ago, 17. it jumped to seventeen. So that's fifteen times more toxic than a healthy human, and uh, that was categorically renal failure. So I was at the ICU and they started me on, they put a catheter in me, my chest shoulder here underneath this shirt. And uh, uh, three times a week, I'm on dialysis until the surgery, which is May 7th. So. And another way that the pandemic impacted all of this also was we had to wait 30 days additional between each vaccine. So we were already kind of behind and then additional 60 days between each vaccine dose, to yeah, be able to yeah, dose. So that put us another 60 days behind. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so. I, think, I think a lot of times we, um, we think, I don't know if you guys thought like this too, but once you got listed, the process may go a little bit more smooth, but you guys had a lot of bumps in the road along the way, it sounds like. And, and I wonder, yeah. um, did, you, did you have to change, uh, Aaron, did you have to change your diet at all? Yes. I mean, I'm always, yeah, I have to be conscious of it because there's a, there's definitely a specific or more specific renal diet, certain foods that are high in potassium and things like that, which you have to avoid with, you know, the combination of your high blood pressure medications and um, the diet that you take in, you know, you have to uh, obviously low sodium, yeah. you know, salt, is one of those things that, you know, just is wreaks havoc on people with high blood pressure. So, you know, salty fries and chips and sodas and all that stuff, which, you know, I wasn't too bad with all of those things, but those kinds of things you have to, I mean, vehemently avoid. And we you were, have to increase your vegetables, your fruits, um, you know, fresh foods, things that are healthy as opposed to anything that's been packaged or processed. When we were used to going out to eat, I mean, we love going to Longhorn. <laughs> we like we liked going on date nights. Occasionally. Yes. Yeah, occasionally. <laughs> but we, I mean, with the pandemic, we went on over a year without even going into a restaurant. So we had to start cooking at home more. And yes. yeah, it, it really changed. It's an important factor. And I think that um, diet and exercise and rest, you know, to reduce your stress, rest, um, is part of keeping yourself in stage one through three, you know, three or lower, um, because once you go into stage four, it's, there's no turning back really. So for those who can, you know, make the change today, you know, on your lifestyle, your diet, um, and that can keep you out of the hospital because I wouldn't wish these experiences on anyone um, if they can avoid them. It's so, yeah. Can't imagine how tough that is for you guys. So you guys are, you know, you guys got through all your testing. You guys found out you guys were a match. Part of that, right, is you each need to have somebody there specifically for you. So come surgery on May 7th, who's going to be there for each of you? Um, we're having family come in from Michigan and St. Louis. And they're coming, you know, uh, brother and aunt. And they're definitely going to be with us for the first two weeks round the clock. Um, we have additional um, home care visits that 
that are, are covered through my insurance from my employer that to come in and to visit those. We have, a, you know, two beautiful church families that we've been connected to for uh, some time now that have both all, you know, volunteered as well to help out with everything. You know, we have a small dog, a small pet, and, you know, they volunteer to keep our dog for a while or walk our dog or what have you and to bring meals or to come and prepare meals. So we just have, you know, an abundance of outpouring of love from people. And it just really is humbling because we kind of traditionally ourselves individually have been kind of trying to be the heroes for other people, our family, other family members, and trying to help people out. And um, it's, it's very humbling to have to actually sit down and, and receive and to actually say it's okay that someone's going to try to do something for us. Um, but it's really, really humbling. Um, Great, you had a, a community support. Yeah, we have community support. Yes, the, yeah. it's communities of faith, you know, our, our church families and stuff that kind of help us. Mm -hmm. So, so going forward, so you guys haven't had the surgery yet. You guys is so will you guys arrive on May seventh, or do you guys have to get there prior to? Well, um, May seventh at 6 a.m. So we're considering like a hotel stay or something the 6th, the night of the 6th yeah. and just, you know, um, easy transport taxi or something to the facility. So her surgery is six in the morning and then they'll um, take the kidney from her. And then my, my surgery is the uh, early afternoon, like 12, one o'clock. Um, all in the same, you know, Northwestern Medical Facility, transplant facility. So awesome. And how yeah. long, Tanya, do they expect you to be in the hospital post? They said that I will be discharged the next day, um, but there were a couple of things that I needed to do. I needed to, I needed to walk. Mm -hmm. I needed to use the bathroom and I needed to pass gas. So they said that those are the three things that I needed to do before I could get discharged. And then Aaron, I think they said he would be there two, up to three two or three days. Two so it's not bad at all. That's so exciting. And Tanya, have you ever had any surgeries before? Or is this going to be your first one? I had one surgery. I had a hysterectomy a couple of years ago. 2018. 2018. So that's the only surgery that I, I've ever had. Um, and it was, you know, pretty invasive. I'm like, well, okay. <laughs> um, but that's the only surgery that I've ever had. I've never broken any bones or anything like that. So, you know, I'm a little nervous about the surgery. Um, I've never had any surgery. Before. You've never had any surgery. So this well, pri you know. prior to them putting this catheter in, I've never had any surgery. They, they put this in with local anesthesia. Maybe yeah. I looked to the left and put a hood on <laughs> and uh, so I couldn't see it. And uh, yeah. Yeah. Just, so. just a week away. I mean, what, what kind of emotions right now? I mean, that's a count, you count down, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's a week away from tomorrow, right? a week from tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Well, again, like I said, I think, you know, throughout all of this process, I've probably gone through every, <laughs> type of emotion you can go through, you know, denial, anger, all of those things, disappointment, sadness, um, regret, guilt, all kinds of things. And uh, I feel like at this point, because it's so close and it's upon us, there's a certain amount of optimism and, and hope and faith, faith in our Lord. And then there's a certain amount of acceptance that this is happening. And um, I might as well relax and trust and, and, and believe um, as it's happening or before it's happening, as opposed to being worried about it and being, you know, fretting and stressing, stressing, because that doesn't help anything. So. Yeah. That's great that you mentioned just having to let go and put it in God's hands and yes. know that you're going to be okay. Yes. Um, you know, it's a certain Absolutely. it's a certain piece that comes with that. I'm just speaking from experience, but it's a certain piece that comes with that. And instead of, uh, like you said, fretting all up to the point where you know it's, but yeah, it, it, and it's important too. You mentioned something earlier. I didn't get a chance to comment on it, but sometimes with with the arrest and everything, you have to be um, when you're uh, 
you have a maybe like you said uh, renal renal stage uh, renal failure or any other condition that requires trans transplant or just a uh, let's say an important surgery you have to be selfish almost a little bit with the arrest you know you you can't push yourself you have to realize your limitations whereas you might not might have not have had those limitations or realized those earlier so mm -hmm. yeah so very true very true yeah absolutely mm -hmm. yeah. It's great to know that again in, in a week's time you'll be, you know, look looking back and waking up to and, and like wow, you know, just feeling, you know, yeah. I, I just can't, yeah, I, like I just can't describe the feelings. But I, I know, it's, I'm it's, just, uh, I'm super thankful. Yes, to my God, I really am. I'm thankful to my God because I'm being given the opportunity to, you know, get things right. It's an instant. Um, prioritization uh, setter for you. If you have any old um, regrets, uh, grudges, disagreements, broken relationships, you know, financial setups, things like that, you have, I'm, I'm given the opportunity to get those things in order, so to speak, mm -hmm. to mend relationships, to main, mend my relationship with my God and with others. And um, I'm just super thankful because it could have just all been over in July, in July, 2019. My father died of his second stroke at this age, at age 50. And to be able to continue to live and now potentially to live years, many years with my wife, um, I'm, just, I'm just super thankful and grateful um, so yeah and tanya how are you feeling going into all this because not only are you having surgery but your husband is having a major surgery right after you know he's having this transplant which you know yes they're, they're taking they're taking part of you and the recoveries you know mm -hmm. not gonna be the easiest thing in the world but it's not gonna be too much but it's life-changing for him and it's life altering for both of you guys together. So how are you feeling about everything right now? <laughs> um, I'm hopeful and uh, try to be as positive as possible, but I'm also a little scared um, because I know that it is going to be life altering. And I know that the journey does not stop after the transplant with my husband. So I, I'm trying to set those expectations of it's not going to be an instant fix. <laughs> um, I'm sure that it will be a gradual change. Um, but our life has just been so kind of up and down with how the kidney disease has impacted us um, just overall that I'm really I don't know how to prepare of what's to come afterwards. Um, I've kind of came with. Um, I wouldn't say comfortable, but I've, you know, we went from like golfing and traveling and doing all these things together to life really being put on hold on so many levels that I'm kind of going into the surgery. Um, I, it's like a big question mark right now for me. Um, and I, I don't know where to be at emotionally um, because I'm trying to be that center point where if it goes in a different direction than what my hope is that I have to be able to like maintain, you know, that. So I'm, I'm trying to go in there neutral with not too high of expectations. So every piece of growth, everything of growth and positive is something that will be more motivating. And then also understanding that um, if there's things that we have to just like kind of put our bootstraps on and, and get in there and fight some more than and, and to be ready to kind of put on our boxing gloves but I'm going in there neutral with hope but also understanding that there, we may have to fight some more and then and, and that's okay um because my hope is that we'll we'll be able to conquer anything that comes our way yeah with our faith we we believe that we will be able to yeah. overcome anything yeah the faith is a huge aspect of everything that's keeping us centered and in our everything. love and our love, for and our love yeah. without faith and love it, it 
it, it's really hard to do. And I think it just takes everything to get through what we're looking at. Yeah. And I think any husband and wife that go through a diagnosis of their loved one that, you know, anybody, a family member, you know, I think if anything, what I've learned with my vows through sickness and health, you know, um, I always, I always tease Aaron. I'm like, when I met you, you were a Lamborghini, <laughs> you know? <laughs> <laughs> so I think, I think that, you know, understanding through sickness and through health is exactly what that means. And people, when you endure and when you go through things like that, that's when you either hold on and, and, you know, I always say no grit, no pearl, like you either you grit with each other or it causes division. And uh, our hope is that we continue to grit with one another because it's times like this that you realize what your marriage really is made of as husband and wife. Yeah, there are some unique challenges to being a married couple with all of this stuff, as opposed to a, a, a different type of relative or friend and donation process. So, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you talk about you know some of the emotions that, you know, the guilt of this, that, you know, she met me. You know, on the on the outside, you know, relatively healthy. You know, in all by all appearances, and then, you know, three and a half years into our marriage, you know, we're in this situation, and here we are now at the five year mark, and we're not quite out of this situation. So, you know, it 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 takes a lot. It takes a lot, but it truly is a test of the character of this amazing person and our relationship so yeah it hasn't been all peaches and cream <laughs> you know no. it hasn't been, been all peaches guys. and cream yeah <laughs> biggest champ for to each of you so what do you think has been the biggest challenge with this whole process so far first this time no first. you go ahead i went first you 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 go first <laughs> <laughs> your turn uh. Um, the side effects of medication, um, being able to be, or that you will be taking post transplant. What, what no, even think? now, like the medication. Yeah. 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 The medication. I mean, um, in marriage, you love being able to be active with your mate. Um, medication plays a huge role in, in all of these levels. We're going to be transparent. Um, you know, um, those medications has, has really took a toll in that area of our lives, um, in the bedroom, um, uh, and sometimes I can't sit through a movie. Yeah. Sometimes he can't sit through a movie. He's sleeping. They fundamentally slow my heart rate and kind of, they're, they're essentially downers on some level. Yeah, they slow my heart rate to combat the the blood pressure and everything. So I think just being yeah. the overall, just the activity that we were used to doing, has it's it's very it's it's went on pause. Um, a movie, <laughs> um, being um, active with one another, um, being able to take a walk together, um, being able to walk our dog. Uh, um, what else would you say? Yeah, you know, our appetites, uh, you yeah. know, not, you know, basically when he has been diagnosed, I was diagnosed with him, so to speak. So the mm -hmm. biggest obstacle is being able to maintain a change, maintain change in our whole lifestyle and still keep that center love for one another without becoming bitter, without becoming angry. Mm -hmm. Um, and there were times where I'm sitting there thinking like, wow, I didn't know that I was going to, I didn't know that I was signing up for this. This would be this early on in our marriage. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that, that that's been the biggest obstacle. Yeah, for me, I would have to say kind of the same thing. You know, I was someone that was walking 10 to 15,000 steps a day, you know, an avid golfer, you know, able to play nine to 18 holes. Uh, at least weekly, you know, all these kinds of things, you know, moving, you know, Pilates and, you know, moving my body a lot more, but having a lot more physical activity to being cut to, you know, a good day being 2000 steps, right? Meaning like, you know, uh, a win in, during some of all of this was just being able to get out of bed, 
right? Just being able to get out of bed was a win some days. And I would catch myself getting frustrated because I was a very active person. I'm always getting up, cleaning, and he would be in bed. And, you know, and I think that that had a lot to do with like the depression and and just trying to accept the diagnosis. And I, I would get angry with him because I was like, why you got something to live for? You're not, you're not dead yet. (laughs) You're not dead yet. And so I would get kind of upset with him. But then I realized that the diagnosis was a lot more than what I could see. Yeah. Uh, You know, than what I could see. And I had, I had to pray about it. I had to understand that that's when my patients came. I had to be patient with him. I had to be nurtured, nurturing with him. I had to love him. And I had to like be still because I was, I was, I was struggling because I felt like I lost my husband already. There was, there was a short period during all of this where I, I didn't even, I didn't even want her kidney because I just didn't want to do, I felt so bad about myself and so bad about all of it that I didn't even want to receive. It, it was really hard for me to get to that stage where I could receive. And to hear you that, you know, from your loved one, when he says something like that, I, I, I don't even want your kidney. Um, that was probably the hardest words that I, that I had to hear coming from somebody that was in that place. Um, and so, you know, when I say it's not always been peaches and cream there, you know, it it causes that additional stress where you have to figure out what you're made of. We're, we're past that point now. (laughs) We're not, we're we're not in negative town anymore. You know, we're in, we're in positive town and we're, we're hopeful and we're optimistic. We're ever faithful. But that was the biggest obstacle. And, you know, even like with the medication and I talk about the side effects, you know, as a, as a husband and a wife, you like to kiss each other. Mm-hmm. And he would be very um, insecure apprehensive, about apprehensive yeah. about his, the his meds breath me because out. the meds would cause a certain. I have a metallic taste in my mouth with chronic kidney disease. You have a, a, a series of symptoms. And one of them is that you kind of have this, no matter how much you brush your teeth and wash your mouth out, you have this metallic taste. Yeah. Um, so the most simple mm-hmm. things that some people take for granted every single day, or I would want to show him affection, he would say, I haven't brushed my teeth yet. So it, it, it plays a huge role mm-hmm. in all aspects of people's lives when it comes to kidney disease. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So now when we look at the other side of it, what do you guys think has been the biggest celebration, the best part of this journey that you guys are taking currently still on you haven't had the transplant quite yet but this journey so far what's the best part of it then I think so far it's just the exhale that we are and all systems go it's fully scheduled it's going to happen you know all the um, clinical boxes are checked if you will for it all and we have you know things lined up in terms of our support network and people helping us and um, people are reaching out to us, you know, uh, news and media outlets like, like yourselves are reaching out to us to talk about the story so we can, you know, bring awareness to people. We can give glory to our God. We can, you know, help raise awareness of all of this and what people have to do to survive and everything like that. So we just see it as an opportunity, you know, a beautiful opportunity and a gift to be able to promote love, to promote um, living donor as a process, and, you know, all of those things, you know, love for each other, you know, um, the stories have been spun a little bit in terms of, you know, racial things and like that, which, you know, is understandable, it's going to be, but um, just all of those things seem to be working, you know, in the positive direction for us, so that's been a big release. Yes. It, it just, it's, it, I think that's part of why I'm not as tense or stressed or, you know, uptight about everything that's happening. It's in, in a position of acceptance and serenity about it all. Finally. Yeah. Yeah. And I think with me, I could finally release knowing, I think I was, I was uptight all the way up until the pre-op. 
until they said May 7th and we were going through the pre-ops. I mean, when I was drawing the 19 vials of blood, I, I think on the last day for pre-op, until they said to me, Tanya, May 7th is a go. I was on edge, meaning I didn't think I could exhale, exhale until I knew for a fact that we would be in that surgery room and Aaron would get that transplant. And um, so I've caught myself. I think I had a, um, you know, eating some chips and dip. I had me a little candy bar <laughs> celebration I drink a little soda. I'm like, you know, trying to reward myself in the little portions of things um, just to say, finally, you know, we're here. And um, so now, you know, um, trying to find time um, to kind of just like relax. So today was like our date day. Um, we usually, we usually had a date night. So, uh, today we took our dog. Um, he's a, he's at camp. We went and got a pedicure. Um, we wanted to do the interview with you guys. And so today was like, our phones were going to, you know, our phones were going to kind of be off. Social media was going to be off. And we wanted to just to kind of get lost with each other and prep for the surgery and kind of say, let's not do anything else, but just be because it's been so long since we've been able to just be. Yeah, this peace. That's yeah. what we're looking for. Just a little peace and relaxation today. Awesome. And uh, yeah, it's been nice. It's yeah, been nice. it has been. And he's got, you got dialysis tomorrow? I have dialysis tomorrow He's got tomorrow dialysis morning, tomorrow. 5.30. Yeah, and you know, and that's one thing I have to say one, real quick though, as we were driving, um, he has to be at dialysis at 5.30 every morning. Ooh, and and I said, um, I said, can you imagine somebody that don't have the support of a, a mate that is not living near a dialysis station, the type of stress and the type of things that people have to go through when they don't have those things and their life depends on dialysis. So I'm hoping to bring awareness and, and, and hoping to be able to advocate, do something for um, I have a, I have a soft spot for wives <laughs> just because maybe, you know, but I, I think that everyone's life changes when it comes to certain things. And I'm hoping to be able to bring awareness and, and, and you know, a connection to people and say, and Hey, these are where the dialysis stations are. Mm -hmm. There's, there's a dialysis station with Lip so many center. miles, the centers of your home or, you know, whatever it may be, because to me, whenever we were in the hospital, the communication, the connections, the referrals, you know, it wasn't very lined up. It wasn't, hey, this is how many um, dialysis centers you have. It, 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 there was just not a lot of awareness and referrals and connections and getting people plugged in so they don't feel like they're on this journey alone. Right. And people like you guys, you know, people like you guys coming in and bringing awareness and, and taking the initiative for the YouTube channel and educating and awareness, you know, you're making, you're turning lemons into lemonade, so to speak. So it's people like you um, that are making the change, not only directly in your community, but in the community of people that need it the most. Really? Absolutely. Thank you, Laura and Jay. Yes, really absolutely. So much for it means a lot. Thank you. So one of my last questions that we like to ask everybody, and you each have to come up with your own, so no cheating and using the same one, is we know that there's so many misconceptions in the transplant and donation world. And we would love for you guys to debunk um, a myth for us about transplant donation that you guys have heard. Okay, well, I've got one for you. Okay. Did you know that by becoming a living donor, if ever down the road you have a problem with your remaining kidney, that you are moved automatically to the top of the recipient list. That's a national program that's not just specific to Northwestern. So if she ever has a kidney problem down the road because she is a living donor, she's automatically popped to the top of the list uh, for being a recipient if she needs a, a kidney. Um, so that's one thing that I, we never knew or never imagined that there's a, a, a on, not necessarily a, a reward system, but essentially 
uh, an acknowledgement of the beauty of that gift of living donation mm -hmm. that if something ever goes wrong with you that you get you know lifted in that list in terms of being a recipient so that's one thing that we, we found amazing along with the whole swap match process that you can give potentially to someone who isn't the person that you would like to give to like a relative or or a, a friend but you could give to someone else who is also in the same situation with you and get it matched up too so it just those are the two things that kind of stood out the most for me <laughs> i'm trying to think um living uh living donors it does not cost you anything financially as far as any of the testing um, it, if your uh, recipient or the individual that you're trying to assist um, has insurance, it does cover your testing. Um, so when people think, how, what does it cost you to be a living donor? It costs you compassion and humanity. Awesome. Thanks, you guys. Those were awesome. Thanks were. for you guys to bust for us today. Mm -hmm. And then I don't know if you're going to have any other questions, but my last question for you each is, for anybody who's sitting in your shoes, who just found out that they needed a transplant or that their spouse is in need of a transplant, what words do you have for them? I went first last time. Come on, it's your turn. <laughs> <laughs> Take one day at a time. It seems like your world is crashing. And in some days it, it will, but there is hope. There are people that can help. Um, ask questions, advocate for your spouse, advocate for yourself as a living donor. Ask questions. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Um, and just because you don't know anything about kidney disease or living donor does not mean that you will not be educated in it, but educate yourself do not rely on the medical teams and the coordinators only. only educate yourself, advocate for yourself, advocate for your partner and go for it. Do what you can to change someone's life. And if you can't change someone's life, just know that there are people out there that can. Yeah. And I think for me, um, what I would say is, um, have faith, have faith. And um, at least for me, um, the God that I believe in is not against knowledge and is not against research, which is the pursuit of knowledge, but between human knowledge and final outcomes mm -hmm. is room for this little space called faith. And I believe that faith makes a huge difference on whether or not you have a good outcome. And I personally, we personally have a faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And um, my faith has made me able to endure all of these things. So I'm not necessarily, you know, preaching that someone has to have my faith and my exact same faith. But I do encourage those to have faith in all of this. Do you have any other questions? No, I just wanted to thank you guys for, for, for coming on. And I just wanted to say you guys are just a living testimonial to hope and, and faith and, and, you know, just uh, belief in God and just the, the closeness that you guys have uh, as a team to, you know, weather the storm and, and come out on the other side of it. So, you know, again, I, I appreciate you guys coming on. Well, we appreciate you. And, and I mean, anything that we can do to, to bring awareness, to help uh, refer people to you. If we know people, we would love to do that. And we appreciate you allowing us to be on your program, because again, it's people like the both of you that are stepping out and making a difference. And don't ever let anybody put water on your fire <laughs> by trying to make change because it's people like you that take that step that create the change that's needed. Yeah. Thank you so much, Jay and Laura. Laura, thank you 
both. Yes. Thank you um, so much. And, you and follow up. Please follow up too. Yeah, I will. We <laughs> Absolutely. will. We yeah. will. I, I will inbox you guys our um e well, you have our emails, but our cell phone numbers. And let's stay mm -hmm. in touch because we want to be your guys' biggest cheerleader. We want to yeah. try to encourage you and, and continue to you know encourage one another because yeah. we're it, it, in reality, yeah. we are family. Right. We, yes. we support yes. this community yep. and what, what you're trying to do, Jay. Absolutely. We really appreciate it. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So thank you guys so much for coming on. I'm Laura. And I'm Jay. We'll see you next time. Thank Thanks you. for joining us today. Make sure to like and subscribe so you don't miss our next guest. We need your help to spread support and awareness for organ transplant and donation. Please share this video and channel with your friends. Tell someone something that you learned or heard from today's guest. Get in touch with us if you'd like to join us as a guest. See you next time. Peace.